Welcome, Abe. Hello. Like Hello. magic, you're Hi. here. <laughs> nice to meet you guys. Tell us, Likewise. who are you and why are you here? My name is Abhay. Uh, I'm a product manager with uh, Amazon MemoryDB for Redis, a uh, service we launched last year. And I'm here to talk about uh, our latest launch uh, and uh, a Kubernetes controller for MemoryDB. All right. So we're going to talk a lot about MemoryDB today. I, I think uh, as a newish service, I should call it, you know, there, there are newer services, there are older services, but it's still newish. Uh, yep. I think people may not be as familiar with it as some of our other database offerings. So MemoryDB, it, just in the name, I could probably guess that it has something to do with in-memory databases. Am I right? That is correct. Yes. Uh, it's an in-memory database. So all data is in memory and, and memory is fast, as you know. So MemoryDB is ultra fast. So it is essentially uh, you know, an ultra fast database. Uh, for workloads that need really low latency, uh, high throughput, and it is fully Redis compatible. So that's in the name. It's called Amazon MemoryDB for Redis. Oh, nice. Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, Redis, a very, very popular, uh, well-known memory database, in-memory database, rather. Uh, why would I use an in-memory in database? What, what kind of uses, uh, specifically, when I'm picking a purpose-built database, would I, what I look for when I'm looking at in-memory databases? Yeah, so you usually, you know, you start with the database, which it could be relational, it could be a key value store, uh, you know, NoSQL databases, depending on, you know, your application and the business logic, you might pick a database. Uh, usually, you, you might then realize, hey, your database isn't fast enough, and then you might want to add a cache on top of it. Uh, and so when you do that, you essentially get speed. But what if you had a database that could be a database and have speed? And that's where MemoryDB comes in. So it's got, uh, it's got data. It is a database. So anything you write is stored, you know, with database grade durability, and it has the speed of uh, storing everything in memory, right? So because everything is stored in memory, we can respond, uh, you know, in microseconds to every query. Um, really, you know, where you might use this is, you know, uh, whereas everyone is moving towards, you know, microservices architecture. Um, and think about an application that has, you know, tens, if not hundreds of microservices, and you've got a user who's sitting in front of your application and expecting a response, you know, usually within milliseconds, which means each of your microservice has maybe single digit milliseconds, maybe even microseconds to respond. And that means your database needs to be just as fast. And that's where MemoryDB comes in. You want to use a database which can uh, support that high throughput, support that low latency, and it can support, you know, a whole bunch of Redis data structures. So you've got a microservice that's want to store that does that wants to store data as linked lists. Hey, you use Redis linked lists. You want you have a microservice that wants to store data as hash maps. Great, store it in MemoryDB as a hash map. So you get you get that flexibility of, that you expect from Redis, and you get a database that is really really fast. So those are you know some of the use cases uh, that you might want to use uh, MemoryDB for. So you mentioned microservices there. Is there a use case for this with like monolithic applications or monolithic databases? You you could use it, right? But mm -hmm. usually when you're using a monolithic application, you've got one database that mm -hmm. is, you know, usually traditionally a relational database uh, and you want to you want to structure your data so that your monolithic application can serve all kinds of queries and all kinds of data needs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you might you could use that with MemoryDB, but it wouldn't really be um, you know, you wouldn't get things like SQL, you wouldn't get things like relational databases because right. that's not something that this is designed for. And okay. so uh, traditionally a monolithic application would be using a relational database and right. you might want to use something like Aurora or, right. you know, another Yeah, the reason I ask is that, um, you know, when they're talking with developers about microservices, one topic that usually comes up is, okay, I've got all this constellation of microservices. Um, do I have to use individual databases for each microservice, yeah. right? Or can I move my monolithic app to microservices and move the database at a slower pace. Yeah, so. that's a good point. Yes, uh, and with MemoryDB, you don't need to have a single or a individual database instances for each of your microservices. You could use, uh, you know, a single database and serve either a monolithic application or serve multiple okay. microservices with it, and you know, get the flexibility of Redis. So you can, you know, as I said earlier, you can store different kinds of data structures at once in the same database. 
Yeah, that's something that a lot of people forget about when talking about microservices. They, they focus very heavily onto the compute side of microservices mm -hmm. and forget if you're still calling from the same monolithic database, right? You're you're still limiting yourself, and you've still got you know uh, basically a single point of failure there, right? And and you're not getting the full aspect of choosing purpose built databases just for the right workloads, things like that. You know, uh, this has actually come up in chat too, and you mentioned Redis already. How it's Redis compliant? I think a lot of people have the classic use case in mind for Redis and maybe even MemoryDB from this of a cache, right? I think everybody knows Redis or, or most people know Redis as a caching layer. Hmm. Uh, but from my knowledge, and, and maybe Abe, you can talk more about this. Uh, there's actually use cases beyond just a cache at this point for an in-memory database. There's been a lot of improvements, a lot of new features that make in-memory databases more persistent or other, you know? Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, you're right. I think uh, Redis uh, started out as a caching service and has since evolved for you know a variety of use cases, uh, especially for data storage. Uh, traditionally, people have used it for you know data that is uh, you know ephemeral, which uh, you know is short lived and maybe potentially lost. And your application is okay even if that data is is sort of lost because it's in memory. Uh, but and. You know, with MemoryDB, though, the innovation that we've come up with is that you get database-grade durability along with Redis, right? So you, are, you could essentially use it as a database. Every write that you send to MemoryDB is acknowledged on disk or written on disk before it is acknowledged back to the client. So once mm -hmm. data is written, it's there. Uh, it's not expected to be lost. So you could use it as a, as a real database instead of just as a cache, right? Where traditionally, you might have a database that you would store your data in for durability, and then you would add a cache on top of it for speed, right? Uh, and uh, now you've got to manage two services. You've got a yeah. cache, mm -hmm. so you've got yeah. to manage and operationalize that, and you've got a database, and you need database administrators to manage that. You, you could do that with one service with MemoryDB, and you don't need to manage two services. You get the speed, and you get the database uh, grid durability uh, along with that. You could, that you could so, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, that all sounds good. <laughs> yeah, stinking, stinking data is never fun, right? It always yep. adds complexity. Uh, yep. You know, what's out of date, which transactions actually right. constitute completed transactions. Mm -hmm. Any type of data sync between two different databases is always uh, complex, no matter what you do. We've actually had some good questions come in chat, too, yep. uh, specifically about memory uh, DB. Uh, how about the fault tolerance from uh, from LinkedIn here? Yeah, so uh, for tolerance, uh, we so we we provide uh, high availability modes. Uh, so you can set up your instances across multiple AWS availability zones, right? And so your data is automatically replicated to, uh, you know, across multiple uh, availability zones. So you could set up replicas uh, that are always replicating uh, data. And in case of a primary node failure, one of your replicas automatically is promoted to become the primary. Uh, and, uh, you know, so you get high availability in that mode. Keep in mind, though, we're talking about availability and not durability, data durability here. You could get strong durability with just one node because the data is not stored on disk on that node, on the primary itself. We've got an internal service where we are actually storing all of the data in. So when a write comes in to your primary, all of the data is persisted on disk on a separate service, which is also replicating the data across multiple AZs. And so you could operate with high durability with just one node. But if you want high, you know, high availability, you want to create replicas across different availability zones, and we will automatically manage failovers across those uh, availability zones. Look at this. It's like you interpreted it, Abe. It's like you felt it coming you Anticipated next. the disturbance in the force. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about availability zones, uh, which is what I'm assuming they're, they're asking here about uh, zones, availability yeah. zone distribution. Yeah, so in terms of durability, that data is automatically replicated across availability zones. So even if, you know, let's say one availability zone is just completely gone, we will, your data isn't still, still isn't lost. You know, that data can still be built back up into the database as soon as the database uh, comes back online. Uh, for service availability, though, database availability, you can create nodes and replicas across different availability zones, and we will manage the failovers, uh, you know, between, uh, between the primary and the replicas. You've uh, you've hit a nerve with the audience. I think the yeah. audience is very very interested yeah. in MemoryDB, uh, yeah. rightfully so. I mean, this is this is very uh, 
important piece of, of anybody's stack, I believe. A highly performant, you know, microsecond retrieval database is pretty compelling, especially when it's not ephemeral and, and more persistent. Uh, yep. Steve, you want to take one of these next questions? Uh, let's see. I'll put it up. Uh, this is more about the uh, the actual architecture of MemoryDB uh-huh. under the scene, uh, behind the scenes. Not sure if we want to get too deep into this or not, Abe. Steve. Yeah, just ask? very very quickly. Uh, you know, so because it is an in-memory database, all data is stored in memory. So every write that comes in is first written to the memory of the primary, but at the same time, it is also written to a uh, to a service which is storing that data on disk across different availability zones. And only when that write is successfully written to that uh, service, uh, what we call uh, the multi-AZ transaction log, that's the name of the service. So when that data is written to that multi-AZ transaction log, that's when we acknowledge the write to the client. And so every write is only acknowledged in that case. Uh, oh, I do so see we know that the, the write has transferred from the the memory to the yep, to the, is, effect of the backup, right? For yep, it is written to memory to the multi az transaction right. log and then acknowledged back to the client, which right. means uh, you know our late, write latency is somewhat slower, right, than right. Uh, traditional Redis, right. where traditional Redis is only writing to memory and responding back within microseconds. We take slightly longer. Uh, it takes uh, less than five milliseconds to complete a write. So if there is a trade-off. You would uh, trade off microsecond mm-hmm. writes to single digit less than five millisecond writes, uh, but you get a strong durability of data. Okay, so we're trading durability for latency. Is that the right way around? Or latency for durability? You're Anything? trading write latency a little bit uh, for yeah. durability, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I think that's a decent trade-off. Any guess, latency yeah. issues during write operations, which we might have just covered, actually. Yeah. Um, yep. A good question. One ah, more. what data formats can we store? Streams? Yeah, so uh, it is fully compatible with Redis. So all data formats that Redis supports, including okay. streams, pub sub, strings, linked lists, hash maps, and a whole bunch of even geospatial data, all of these data structures and formats are supported. And you can store that uh, you know, in memory with memory DB. Nice. You know what's interesting is uh, we haven't even gotten to the announcement that you you were coming <laughs> on to talk about, uh, which I, it's very exciting to me. I, I'm I I like Kubernetes. Big fan of Kubernetes. Um, and so we have published what are called AWS controllers for Kubernetes, which essentially let you, as a Kubernetes administrator, go in and provision AWS uh, infrastructure, right? Like provision a memory DB cluster, for example, directly from things like the cube controller right, or cube control uh, CLI, right? Through custom resources uh, with a manifest, just like you would basically any other object in your Kubernetes cluster. So do you want to talk to us a little bit about what you're launching uh, with those AWS uh, controllers for Kubernetes? Yeah, yeah. So as you were chatting about earlier, right, that uh, this service or this database is is purpose built or designed for microservices. And, uh, you know, microservices are using... Uh, Kubernetes and and containerized applications in general quite a bit, uh, right? And that's uh, giving developers, uh, you know, control, uh, fast deployments, uh, continuous deployment, and and a whole bunch of other benefits. And so we want to continue building towards that. And uh, so just last month, we launched uh, the AWS controller for Kubernetes support for MemoryDB. And so now you can ins- manage MemoryDB resources directly from Kubernetes. And so as your application is deployed and managing all of the resources, you can also manage your database directly from Kubernetes. And so as your, you know, for example, your application boots up and gets instantiated, the same time your database gets instantiated. And then as you're cleaning up resources, you can clean up your database resources um, from Kubernetes as well. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, so we've we've launched that support into developer preview last month. Uh, it's ready for use today. Uh, and uh, I know we've got some time set aside for a quick demo. I'm gonna show exactly how that works, how straightforward and easy it is. And uh, yeah, we can walk, walk through that. Yeah, let's do it. All right, Abi, you ready for me to share your screen? Let's do it. Cool. All right, so here's the CLI. So I'm not gonna, uh, I'm, I'm gonna run the Kubernetes uh, um, CLI and you know instantiate a memory DB cluster. So let me just uh, first go to the memory DB console here on AWS. 
So I already created a cluster earlier, um, you know, before the demo, uh, because I wanna uh, I wanna talk to this da uh, database uh, from the CLI in a bit. But uh, as you can see, there's one database that exists here, uh, you know, single shard with three nodes, meaning there's one primary and two replicas in this uh, database. So let's go ahead and create another one uh, using uh, Kubernetes here. So let's uh, let's see. Let me show you the manifest file. Um, you know, this is a standard manifest file format for Kubernetes. Uh, as you can see here, we're going to create a cluster. Uh, this cluster is is essentially an entity for memory DB, which is a, a database cluster. Uh, the name of the cluster here, a description, optional. We can specify the node type. So in this case, I'm just going to create a small database. So a T4G small uh, node type, a single shard. Uh, sorry, a single shard here and a single replica per shard. So you will have two nodes uh, in each shard, uh, essentially a database with two nodes, one primary and one replica, and then a whole bunch of other parameters, you know, including some security groups. These are mostly optional, but I did create the security group earlier. So I'm just going to reuse that here, right? So that's that's your normal manifest file. I'm going to go through this. And so let's, uh, let's apply this and create this. So let's uh, go ahead and we're going to, Say hey, go ahead and create this cluster. And there I will. Uh, I'll state the obvious here for anybody because uh, I didn't. I didn't quite catch this the first time I looked at this. But this is actually creating it in AWS in the AWS uh, your AWS account. Whatever credentials you've set up to to have access to AWS, uh, that's how it goes out and creates. If if you have questions about that in the ACK documentation, there's. There's a lot about adding credentials and how to connect back up to your AWS account. That kind of threw me through a loop, but you know, it's I, I didn't mean to break up the uh, flow of your demo there. Uh, but no, I no, thanks that for bringing that up. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. And behind the scenes, I had already set up, you know, my Kubernetes controller here. Uh, it is running on EKS, uh, the Elastic Kubernetes service for AWS uh, right now, and so it is using my credentials. I've set up the permissions beforehand. And uh, when I when I run this uh, cube controller application, uh, you know, command line interface here, it's instructing Kubernetes on EKS to go create a memory DB cluster on my behalf uh, in my AWS account. And as you can see here, there it is. It's creating that cluster right here. Uh, it'll take a few seconds to instantiate, uh, but uh, rather than wait for that, let's uh, go back here and uh, let's try and see uh, if we can connect to, uh, you know. Uh, so as you can see, let's look at all the clusters here. This is the one that we just created 86 seconds ago. This one's the one that I created yesterday uh, that you saw earlier. Uh, I'm going to show how straightforward it is. If you're an existing Redis customer, for example, you could, uh, you know, you could connect to it using your existing Redis client. So I'm just going to pull the Redis endpoint from this cluster. This essentially this command is saying get cluster this example, MemoryDB cluster name and the cluster endpoint address. Here's the endpoint, as you can see. And then what we're gonna do is simply connect to it using the Redis CLI. So here's the Redis CLI. This is the open source Redis client uh, that comes with, uh, you know, your regular open source Redis. I'm gonna connect to this endpoint that we just pulled on the normal Redis port to 6379. Oops, there you go, there. I'm connected to Redis. Now I can just, you know, run Redis commands on memory DB. So set A to 100. There you go. Get the value of A. Get the value of A. You can, you know, set. Uh, you can set maybe, you know, let's create a hash map here. So hash one, and I'm going to say A is equal to B and C equals D. There you go. So H get all hash one. There you go. So as you see, you can. You, Point your existing Redis application to MemoryDB, and it will work, uh, you know, like a Redis database, but with strong durability. Yeah, that was one of my favorite parts of MemoryDB is uh, it's it's fully compliant with Redis. Like, I don't have to go in if I'm using Redis. I don't have to change any lines of code. You know, I can use the the popular open source libraries that are available for Redis. No changes. I just change the essentially connection string, right? Yep, exactly. You just change the endpoint, and your existing Redis client and Redis application can just talk to MemoryDB instead of uh, you know your previous Redis implementation. Nice. One other question I had too about the ACK uh, for MemoryDB, and I, I assume in general for all the the 
AWS controllers for Kubernetes. You mentioned EKS. This works on just Kubernetes though, right? You don't have to be using EKS, right? No, you don't have to be using EKS. You can you can you can be deploying Kubernetes whatever you want. And uh, yes, uh, your AC your AWS controller for Kubernetes works with Kubernetes in general. Uh, I just used EKS because well, I work for AWS. <laughs> well, okay. So back to some questions here. So some some natural questions that might come up as like, how is this different from say Elasticash for Redis or? DynamoDB with, you know, DynamoDB Accelerator DAX. Can you talk to that? Yes. So ElastiCache is a Redis compatible cache. Um, it is intended, you know, to be used as a cache or mm -hmm. as an ephemeral data store. So you would use it, you know, along with another uh, database like, say, DynamoDB or Aurora, and you would add a cache to speed up data access. So, you know, when, you, when your app database is too slow, you might want to add a cache and get, uh, uh, you know, faster performance. Mm -hmm. You might also use ElastiCache as an ephemeral data store, meaning a database where, uh, you know, data loss isn't really a concern, meaning your application can tolerate potential data loss, right, in case of the node going down or the availability zone going down you know you might lose that data and your application is okay with that there are there are applications that are that are fine with that for example uh let's say you know you might be uh, storing user session data like login information mm -hmm. right and hey the database is gone and the user has to re-log in it's not the end of the world but there are applications that need uh, much stronger durability and that's where memory db would come in now uh, you would if you want your data if you cannot you know afford to lose your data essentially you would use uh, memory db um, and between you, you talked about DynamoDB and DAX. Yeah, I think so. DAX essentially acts as a cache on top of DynamoDB, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's essentially it. You instead of using DAX and DynamoDB at the same time, you could use MemoryDB, which is one database to manage instead of two, right? And mm -hmm. you get uh, the fast performance as well as uh, database grade durability. The one other difference is MemoryDB is Redis compatible, while DynamoDB isn't. And so mm -hmm. if you want to use those Redis data structures, you, you know, you wouldn't be able to do that with DynamoDB or DAX. You would have to do that with. Uh, right. I'd have with to do code changes at that point. Right. Whereas yep. this is just exactly. switching the different endpoint. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you, you had mentioned something earlier too, that I think ties into some questions we have from the audience um, about mm -hmm. DynamoDB and DAX and uh, MemoryDB. So we've got a couple people asking about, uh, Pricing Cost. for uh, yeah. for memory DB. Can you talk about that um, and, and maybe give us some some final thoughts uh, at the same time? Yeah. So memory DB is priced uh, is is an instance based service, right? So you essentially choose the instances, the EC2 instances that you want to run memory DB on. Depends on your workloads. So if, depending on your data size, for example, you would choose instances that can support at least that much uh, memory. Um, and so you pay for inst uh, for the instance per hour. Uh, the instance hour pricing for MemoryDB is available on our website, aws.amazon.com slash MemoryDB. Uh, so you essentially pay for the instances that you use. Um, the instance prices are, uh, you know, uh, slightly more expensive than ElastiCache uh, because, again, ElastiCache is a cache. MemoryDB is a database. Uh, so you yeah. would see some pricing differences there. Uh, you, MemoryDB also charges for data written. So we charge on a per GB month basis for every gigabyte that you write to the database. Uh, and again, this is to cover our costs for the database uh, durability that we, that we store uh, on disk. Um, that, is, uh, uh, that is again about, about uh, two, uh, 20 cents per gigabyte per month. Uh, so that is uh, also available on aws.amazon.com slash MemoryDB. In terms of cost though, you know, as I was, where we were talking about earlier, if you want fast database, uh, if, so if you want a database that is ultra fast, uh, you know, you could add a cache on top of a database, but then you would be paying for two services, yeah. Um, two services yeah. versus, yeah. yeah, versus one like MemoryDB. And we've done some analysis, and many of our customers actually end up saving costs by switching from a cache and database to MemoryDB because now you're just paying for a single database and you don't have to pay for two services. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, as uh, as I said, uh, the pricing is available online on our website. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and yeah, we can cover there. If there are other questions, uh, you know, uh, I would love to share an email address. Hopefully it's easy to remember memory. slash help at amazon.com. Feel free to reach out to us. 
I and a bunch of my teammates are on there. We'd be glad to help you out uh, with your uh, questions. But uh, yeah, I'm excited to announce the uh, Kubernetes support, uh, you know, and I'm excited to see how our customers uh, who are building or using containerized applications today will now have a database that can, you know, uh, live up to their expectations for speed and performance. All right, Abe, thank you for joining mm -hmm. us. That was uh, that was phenomenal. What do you think, mm -hmm. Steve? I think it's great. I, I love the the way you can just switch over, and you can, you know, if you're using Redis today, just as a cache, and then you can switch over. Now I've got the benefits of a backing database store, right? Um, I think that's great. Yeah. Abe, thanks for joining us. Uh, please come back, visit us yeah. again sometime once once you all uh, make some more uh, features for MemoryDB. We'd love to hear more about it. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. And uh, yeah, right. nice meeting everyone. See ya, Abe.